he's an epidemiologist, he is a doctor, he is a, uh, a really special person. He really defines the word polymath. He's done a lot across a lot of fields. He's won all kinds of accolades. Let's meet Larry Brilliant. No, 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 they're doing the video first. Oh, go on, go on, Dr. let's go. Dr. Larry Brilliant on. spends his days seeking solutions to the world's worst problems like climate change, nuclear proliferation, and pandemics. Let me show you a simulation of what a pandemic looks like. The disease will spread from country to country so fast that you won't know what hit you. On day one, there were two people, and then four, and then 16. In three months, it's a billion. That's where we're headed. Brilliant was the senior technical advisor on Contagion. Ironically, it was another movie from the 60s that propelled him on a lifelong journey to make the world a better place. I became the doctor in an absolutely awful movie called Medicine Ball Caravan. Now, you know from the 60s, you're either on the bus or you're off the bus. I was on the bus. And he stayed on the bus after the movie ended, traveling with his wife, Garija, best friend, Wavy Gravy, and a busload of hippies across the Khyber Pass and into Nepal. Well, the first days are the hardest days. One of the Sherpas carried Wavy's toys. The other carried my medicine. And the doctor and the clown and our wives walked for 30 days. Everybody who was sick would come out so that, you know, we'd arrive and there'd be people waiting to see Larry. And Larry would hold clinic. But we wound up in India. And then, like everyone else in our generation, we went to live in a Himalayan monastery. <laughs> After two and a half years, Brilliant's guru told him to put on a suit, join the World Health Organization, and go help eradicate smallpox. We printed two billion copies of this photograph, and we took them hand to hand, door to door, to show people and ask them if there was smallpox in their house, because that was our surveillance systems. And as we did that, the number of reported cases in the world dropped to zero, and in 1980, we declared the globe free of smallpox. That experience made Brilliant an optimist. He has since taken on the fight to eradicate polio, founded the SIVA Foundation, which has restored sight to more than three million blind people, created one of the first online social networks, and now he's attempting his most ambitious project. I wanna make it part of our culture that there is a community of people who are watching out for the worst nightmares of humanity. His goal, nothing short of saving the world as we know it. Ladies and gentlemen, Larry Brilliant, and to engage him in conversation, the CEO of Imagine Solutions, Randy Anik. The floor is yours. Thank you. You're going to see three slides that are simple about Larry, and you also just saw a video. And as you can tell, there's a huge amount to know about Larry and what he can share with this audience. And the last slide that starts us off is a slide that is a quote from Jeff Skoll, who's a good friend of Larry's, and gave us the way to try to have a conversation with Larry. And that is simply, he will take us through midnight with his stories. <laughs> so what I have done is created a bell to kind of go from one subject to another. And Larry's trying to take the bell off the thing. <laughs> but we can't do that, otherwise we won't start. So let me start with the beginning, Larry. We're gonna put the big elephant in the room. Coronavirus, your normal knowledge, thoughts. Well, thank you very much, Randy. Thanks everybody for coming. It's a wonderful event. It's a great day. Um, Randy's been asking me to come and speak for many years, and each year there was some schedule conflict. I, I called him this year. There was nothing going on epidemiologically, so there was no problem. <laughs> and then came coronavirus. So, so let me first of all tell you what it's not. This is not the zombie apocalypse. This is not, as we heard earlier today, a mass extinction event of humanity. But it's also not nothing. 
it's a serious outbreak. We can parse words about pandemic or not. It is a pandemic, but WHO is reluctant to use that word in a specific sense as it triggers a lot of legal follow-ons. Right now it's in 30 countries, roughly 80,000 cases, a death rate of about 2%, and it is a, a novel virus. In other words, it's a virus that 7.8 or 8 billion people are not immune to. And all we have to deal with it are 15th and 16th century tools of isolation, quarantine, personal hygiene, social distancing. That's the dilemma that we face right now. Great. Thank you very much. Let me take you to question number two. I didn't have to do this. Question number two, you've positively impacted millions of people. Specifically, I know you've saved five million lives with the SIVA Foundation. Blind, blind gave, gave people. Back sight I, to five million can you blind. tell us a little bit about that? So uh, after we eradicated smallpox, the, the group of us who had been part of that voyage wanted to do it again, something like that. And I was a professor at the University of Michigan. My wife was getting her PhD, and we gathered some people from our Rolodex to think of what we could do. But as you've seen from that film, our Rolodex was a little bit weird. Uh, so we had a clown, Wavy Gravy. It's a lot easier to get an epidemiologist than it is to get a clown. We had a lot of WHO people, a lot of CDC, a lot of faculty members, but also a lot of very spiritual people from every religion you could think of. And I wanted to create a follow-on to smallpox, which was to get rid of childhood diarrhea. It was and still is one of the major <coughs> causes of death in children. My friend Wavy Gravy, who was the master of ceremony at Woodstock, he immediately said, I'll put on a rock and roll benefit concert for diarrhea. We will call it no shit. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's the way the Save a Foundation began. <laughs> and since then, we've had about almost 100 benefit concerts. You cannot think of a musician that hasn't done part of that benefit. We've raised over $200 million just from those benefit concerts, and um, our projects and our programs and our grantees, not us, have given back sight to more than five million blind people, and I, we're really pretty proud of that. Thank you. Larry, you talked about with me earlier three people in philanthropy, philanthropy that you think the world of, three people that this audience ought to know a little bit more about. So I'm a, a lucky beneficiary of capitalism. I would be disingenuous not to say that at the beginning. Uh, I worked at Google. I've, I've run some startups. Al along the way, I've been privileged to work with Jeff Skoll, who was the first president of eBay. I ran the Skoll Global Threats Fund. I'm on the board of the Skoll Foundation. Jeff's amazing ability to bring together all the organs of society to help 108 social entrepreneurs each with a $1.5 million grant, and all the work the Skoll Foundation does is inspiring to me. Um, Mark Benioff. Mark is the founder of Salesforce. He also created Salesforce.org, which was the nonprofit branch of it. I was on that board for 16 years. And um, I just love what Mark Benioff is able to do in the public sphere, to question our assumptions about policies. He now owns Time Magazine and is changing it over. He's another one of my inspirations. And perhaps most of all, uh, Lorene, Lorene Jobs. Today is Steve Jobs' birthday. Uh, Lorene um, has taken what Steve did and left her these resources and has turned it into something called the Emerson Collective. She's been working on immigration policy, on homelessness, and most of all on education, which I think most of us would agree that public school education is the thing that can bring us back together again. Those are three people, among many others, that I admire so much in the field of philanthropy. Great. Tell us why you can do anything, even save the world. You know, when I, when I came to India, when my wife and I came to India on these funny colored buses, these psychedelic painted buses, I mean, and we went to little villages all throughout. We lived in Afghanistan, Iraq, Pakistan. 
Muslim villages, Hindu villages, Buddhist villages, Christian villages, when we would ride into town, we must have looked like Martians. Can you imagine? And we would go into these villages and they would treat us so kindly, as weird and as strange as we must have looked. And I got to go from that to being part of this program to eradicate the worst disease in history. Smallpox killed half a billion people, 500 million people in the 20th century. When I first got to India, a quarter of a million children died that year of smallpox. And then I met the last little girl, Rahima Banu, who had that killer disease, and that was the end of a chain of transmission that went back to Pharaoh Ramses III. If you were me, and you had gone through that voyage, you'd seen that amount of death. I've been in villages with thousands and thousands of children dying, held them in my arms. And then I saw the last case. How could you not be optimistic? How could you not feel that anything is possible? I work with people of every religion, every color, every race. We all work together. We can do that again. I remain optimistic about that, and I will until I die. That's great. Thank you. We have an audience of 600 plus or minus. What would you like them to know about, think about, or do something about? About coronavirus or about no, anything? things that are on your mind. Well, life is short. You know, I see every day uh, engineers who've had exits in Silicon Valley made a lot of money and they're, they're bitterly despondent and depressed about the state of the world. They want to be able to go back to their kids and say what they're working on and that makes a difference. They don't care about the money, they've done that. Or, or they, even if they haven't done that, they want to be able to construct a narrative of their life that has room for God, that has room for love and compassion, and for purpose. And if you don't have that in your life, you're not going to be able to explain what you've done to your children and your grandchildren and you're not going to be able to explain it to yourself. So it's not what I would like you to do. It's what I want to do for me, and I invite you to do the same thing for you because it makes me feel much better as a human being. Oh, spectacular. Thank you very much. Larry on compassion. I've seen you talk about it at, at salesforce.com. I've seen you use that as examples of what you need to talk to young people about. Talk a little bit about that. Now, the Dalai Lama says that kindness and compassion are his religion. It's not Buddhism. <laughs> uh, it's certainly part of every religion, isn't it? All of ours. What, what greater calling is there than to try to put yourself in the shoes of the other person and understand what you can do for them? And, and again, we don't do it for other people. We do it for us. We do it because whether it's the endorphins that it creates, whatever it does, it makes us feel more connected to the mystery of life. Why did we take birth? Where do we go after death? I'm confident that all of those questions will have a better answer if we live a life of love and compassion. That's great, thank you. You have done a great job on time. You're, we are actually running ahead of time, if you can believe that. So I'm going to take you to a different place. Tell us a story or two about you and the Grateful Dead. <laughs> um, so uh, because of, uh, <laughs> I was this rock doc on the movie you saw, uh, and because when we started the Seva Foundation, the Grateful Dead and Jefferson Airplane and Crosby, Stills and Nash and Joan Baez have all done benefit concerts for us. So sometimes the parties at our house get a little strange. So I'll tell you a story about Jerry Garcia. When uh, Gerridge and I were living in Ann Arbor, my wife and I were living in Ann Arbor, and I was a professor of epidemiology, the Grateful Dead were playing in Detroit, and we invited them to stay at our house. We also had the SEVA Foundation Board of Directors meeting at that time, also at our house. And, um, uh, Baba Ramdas and I were playing paddle ball with Bobby Ware and Wavy Gravy in a paddle ball court on our lawn. And we saw Jerry Garcia, who was sitting off 
watching the river go by, wearing his trademark black t-shirt, black shoes, black bent. And um, I think it was Bobby Weir said, let's go get Jerry and get him to play paddle ball with us. So I went down and I got Jerry and I said, Jerry, come on up here quick. You know, Ramdas wants to say something to you. Wavy's got a gift for you. And so Bobby, and so Jerry Garcia came up and Wavy came up and he said, here's a gift. It's a paddle ball racket. Go play paddle ball. And Jerry Garcia said, F no. <laughs> You're just trying to get me and cheat me into exercising. <laughs> and he went back and we continued that game. <laughs> That's really cool. Once again, you are ahead of time. You're doing a great job. Talk to us about anything you'd like to think about out loud with this group. So there is a movement on the West Coast uh, in philanthropy. Uh, in, uh, we, we joke and we say, in San Francisco, our billionaires are not like other billionaires. Uh, Mark Benioff, on the cover of the San Francisco Magazine, said, if you don't give back, you're not meeting the table stakes of doing business in the Bay Area. And so we have lots of different foundations. Um, and many of them are just starters, people who are getting their, you know, just beginning to understand philanthropy. And usually that means they're gonna build a hospital and name it after their grandfather or endow a school uh, or give something to the engineering college that they went to. And over time, they get deeper and deeper into a problem that resonates with them. Blindness, maybe because their grandmother was blind. Cancer, maybe because their father or their mother died from cancer. Something that means something for them. And to see these great business minds that have conquered a world of cash flow and EBITDA apply their minds to solving philanthropic problems, I think is one of the things that's going to help us the most. I don't think it's cheap. I don't think it's silly. I don't think it's uh, window dressing or greenwashing. I invite everybody who has the opportunity to engage in philanthropy to find something that you are passionate about and put all of your resources, but especially this one, to work in trying to solve that problem. Larry, you've done a great job. And we're so ahead have you. of schedule. No, I'm not. You're ahead of schedule. We have two things. One, we present you with this bell oh. for today because <laughs> you've kept us on schedule. And second of all, ladies and gentlemen, Larry Brilliant. That's great.